In this video, we will cover many of the units you'll need to be familiar with when getting started with circuits, volts, amps, ohms, and watts. For each unit, we will talk about the quantity it is used to measure, the variable used to represent that quantity if you encounter it in an equation, the name of the unit itself, the abbreviation for that unit, which you have to be careful not to get mixed up with the abbreviation or variable for the quantity, and finally, some typical values. This is something you might not encounter as often in a physics course, but it's really important when you're starting to work with practical circuits to kind of have a sanity check and know what range you would expect typical or reasonable values to be in. For each value, we will go over a few different things. The quantity itself, the unit used to measure it, the equivalent units, a description of the quantity, an analogy uh, to a fluid mechanical system, which is not perfect, but sometimes helpful for people to get started understanding this, and finally, some typical values, which you might not encounter if you are taking or have taken just a purely theoretical physics course. When you're getting started with laboratory electronics, it's kind of helpful to know what realistic or typical values you would expect are. So if you're doing a calculation and taking measurements, you know if you're kind of in a realistic range. So first up, we have voltage, which is abbreviated with a V if you encounter it in an equation. It is measured in units of volts, which are also abbreviated with a V. One volt is equivalent to one joule per coulomb, or J over C. We're not gonna talk about these equivalent units as much. That's more what you would see in a physics class. In the electronics course, we prefer more about the application and measurement of these units. The description here, you may hear this called electric potential difference. Be careful, it is not potential energy. Remember, this is a joule per coulomb. It is not just measured in joules, so you might hear it just called electric potential sometimes. But again, be careful not to get it mixed up with pure potential energy. You might also hear this referred to as other things. For example, EMF, or electromotive force, which is a bit of an older term, but still used by some textbooks and other resources. And the fluid analogy here is pressure. So this is sort of the push that is pushing on electrical current, which we'll talk about next, and making it flow. Again, you have to be careful with the fluid analogy. It's not perfect. But I do find that helps some people visualize what's going on with electricity since it's a little less intuitive and it's something that we cannot see. Typical values in a laboratory electronics course are going to be on the order of about 1 to 10 volts. For example, a AA battery is 1.5 volts. Something like an Arduino runs on 5 volt logic, and a 9 volt battery is, well, not surprisingly, 9 volts. You're probably not going to see values as high as, for example, 120 volts here. That's what you would get from a wall outlet in the US. That is a little more dangerous, not something you really want to tinker around with when you are just getting started. You're going to want to leave that up to an electrician. Next up, we have current. You will usually see this abbreviated with an I. I prefer to use a capital I. Some textbooks or lectures will use lowercase. That is measured in units of amperes, abbreviated A. You will almost always hear this just abbreviated as amps. Most people do not bother saying amperes out loud. An ampere is equivalent to one coulomb per second, or one C per S. And the description, this is the flow of charge. So coulombs are the unit of electrical charge that, again, you will encounter more in a physics course, not as much in an electronics course, but coulombs per second gives you a flow rate. So the fluid analogy here is the flow of water, except in this case, we're talking about flow of electrical current, which is positive or negative charges. Typical values here, now a coulomb is pretty big and therefore an amp is pretty big. So values you're gonna see when working with small benchtop hobbyist electronics are usually more in the milliamp to 100s of milliamps ranges. That is for when you're talking about things like LEDs or for the hundreds of milliamps, maybe up to around an amp for small motors. Getting up into the amps or tens of amps is when you are talking more about large household appliances like vacuum cleaner, microwave, washer dryer, that sort of thing. So when you're working with benchtop equipment, remember that an amp is pretty big. You're probably gonna be seeing values more down in the milliamp to 100 milliamp range. Next up, we have resistance, which is abbreviated with an R. That is measured in units of ohms, which are abbreviated with the capital Greek letter omega, 
one ohm is equivalent to one volt per amp. We'll learn more about that when we talk about Ohm's law in a future video. So that is a volt per amp here. And the description is here kind of hard to define with a different word. It's the resistance. It's the opposition to the flow of current or how hard it is for the current to flow. And friction is sort of an analogy there or think about maybe the diameter of a pipe and narrower pipe, it's gonna be harder for water to flow through that. So again, the fluid analogy is not perfect, but think of it like just the opposition to flow or resistance to flow. And typical values here can range a lot more. When you are working with discrete resistors that we are going to talk about more in future videos, they can be anywhere from single digit ohms to tens of ohms to hundreds of ohms up to even kilo ohms, mega ohms. So depending on the application, you will see a much bigger range here for resistors. It's not a narrow range for more typical values like you have with voltage and current. Finally, we have power, which we will abbreviate with a P. This is measured in units of watts, which are abbreviated with a W. A watt is one joule per second. So remember power, again, you should see this in a physics course, is a measure of energy per second. And the, I'm not really gonna bother with the description and analogy here as much. Again, it's energy per unit time. And power is sort of the same thing across different domains, whether you're talking about a fluid or a mechanical or a thermal or an electrical system. So power is power. I don't really know how else to describe it. And again, a watt is, um, again, we'll see the equation in a future video, wattage is voltage times current. So you can kind of figure that out by multiplying the values you see up here. You might see things in the milliwatt range or tens of milliwatts for something small like an LED for small motors or something like a cell phone charger. If you look at the label on your cell phone charger, for example, those will typically be in a five to 10 watt range. When you're getting up into hundreds or thousands, so kilowatts, then you're talking more again about larger household appliances. A microwave's a good example. You usually know that well, your microwave might be 800 watts or 1000 watts or 1100 watts or something like that. So probably not gonna be working with wattages that high, again, when you are working with benchtop electronics. So to recap there, voltage, current, resistance, and power are four of the quantities you are going to be using a lot when you get started working with circuits. We're not gonna get into other units like capacitance and inductance until a little later on. So you should be comfortable with knowing what the variables are that are used to abbreviate those. Be careful not to get them mixed up with the abbreviation for the unit. And you should have kind of a qualitative sense of what these are measuring and what typical values will be. So you can kind of do a sanity check and know if when you are, for example, taking measurements or doing an experiment, if your values are in a reasonable range.